Hi everyone, welcome to Sacred Musings of me, Phil Saker. It is the 13th of January 2022. Um, does anyone know when we go from saying 2022 to just saying 22? You know, because it seemed to happen in the, you know, I grew up in the uh, 80s and 90s, you know, and um, uh, in like the, the late 90s, we didn't say 1997 or whatever, we just said 97. So does anyone know when we go from saying 2022 to 22? Um, answers on a postcard, let me know in the comments below, the important issue of the day. Um, so today, uh, last week in the podcast, uh, I was looking at how we need to learn to live. And, you know, I spent a lot of time over the past few months um, kind of critiquing, I guess, the the response of our society and particularly the church uh, to COVID. And what um, I said we need to do this year is we need to actually live. We need to learn what living actually is. And so that's what we're going to, to do today. I'm going to start a new series and I've just called it um, uh, More Than Survival. You know, more than survival because it is more than uh, it is more than just kind of um, uh, you know life is more than about base biotic survival um, it's more than about just you know extending our years but it's actually about living well and quality of life we might say rather than just the duration and so that's what um, we're going to be looking at today and um, we're going to be looking at relationships that's the first thing um, in the in the list um, as you may know all of those things you know will kind of bleed in together um, but I'm hoping over the course of the next few weeks to build up a picture looking at various different things if if there's anything that you would like to suggest um, that I look into then please do um, either let me know in the comments or e email me through the website it just struck me this morning that I need to set up a dedicated email address uh, for Sacred Musings now that it's got its own name um, because, um, you know, while well, irreverent podcasts have got their own email address, so I've got to have my own email address as well. Um, there we go. Um, just one or two notices um, before we get into that, though, um, that there are, um, yeah, thank you to everyone who's emailed me um, over the last week or two. I really do appreciate people getting in touch and I'm sorry I can't you know, um, respond kind of fully to, I'd, I'd like to include a lot of people's emails in in here. Um, it just struck me just again how important this is because, you know, people are telling me about, you know, churches where, you know, it, it's really almost impossible to do anything um, because of all of the, the restrictions, you know. Um, and, um, you know, I hear about people who are not going to church because they feel like they can't at the moment and, and all that kind of thing. And I think it's so important to think through what what church and what life uh, should be like. And so I hope that this will be helpful in, in beginning to do that. Uh, but thank you to everyone who's emailed yeah, emailed in. And thank you to those who've um, donated as well. Um, I really appreciate all of the, the support. And, you know, I feel like this is actually growing as, you know, growing as a bit of a community. Um, just a reminder that there is a Telegram group as well, if you'd like to join on that. Um, there aren't, you know, hundreds of people, but uh, you can join in the Telegram and there is, if you're on YouTube, there is an audio podcast. The link, if you expand the description on YouTube below, is down there. Um, if you're on the podcast audio, you can watch this on YouTube as well, if you prefer. Um, so, yeah, uh, someone was asking about that. Final thing to mention, um, I uh, I mean, you know, there's been loads of good stuff that's been written over the last few, few, um, uh, few days. Um, I do try and share that on Twitter. Um, but I just wanted to give a particular special mention to a letter which was written by a professor, Ehud Kimwaram. Um, he is a, a head of the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at Tel Aviv University, one of the leading Israeli immunologists. And he wrote this open letter criticising the Israeli and the global management of the coronavirus um, pandemic. It is an absolute barnstormer of a letter. It's fantastic. And I think it would equally apply to, you know, with maybe one or two small modifications to the UK response to, to COVID. Um, so if you haven't read it, do have a look because I think it's it's fantastic. Uh, yeah, so so do, do have a read of that. I'll put the link in the description or in the show notes down below. So with that said, we're going to look into relationships uh, today about what it means. So um, I've got my, my little slideshow back um, this week and I've got some quotes on there. But don't worry, if you're on the audio podcast, um, I'll read everything out. Um, this is just really to remind me more than anything. So uh, let's, uh, let's dive into that. 
So yes, this is More Than Survival, the first one of this series, and it's on relationships. I don't really know why I decided to start with relationships. It it seemed like an appropriate place to begin, um, because it is fundamental, but there are other places that you could have begun as well. Um, next week, I want to look at fear, because I think that's a, a, another really important issue. So, but you know, there are all sorts of things which feed into this. So I think week by week, we'll just be, you know, looking into into different aspects and, and they will all interrelate, you know, so um, we'll probably cover similar ground, but I hope that, you know, to build up a picture over time of of what life should be like and how we should be living. So let's begin by uh, thinking firstly about the purpose of our lives. Let's think about the, the, the overall kind of purpose of our lives before we look specifically at relationships. And this will kind of set the tone for everything else in the coming weeks as well. So why did Jesus come? What was his purpose? I read some of these verses last week, but I'll, I'll um, just read uh, out these again. John 10 verse 10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I, that's Jesus, have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So Jesus says that the reason he came was for us, those who believe in him, to have life. That's why Jesus came. And it's not just any old life. It's not mediocre life, but it's life to the full. And that's what he said. And this is picked up uh, elsewhere. So, for example, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 19 says, uh, In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Life that is truly life. And Paul here is referring to kind of living in a right and moral way, not loving money, but being generous. And that he says that is life which is truly life. So the implication is that there is a life that you can live, which is not truly life. But that we as, as Christians, you know, we should be living life which is truly life. That's what we need to be doing. And um, when does that life begin? I just got one more quote here from Jesus, from John chapter 5, verse 24. Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. So Jesus says that the life that he's talking about is not something that begins in the future, you know, with eternal life. It doesn't begin when we die and then when we start, you know, living that eternal life. But it begins in the here and now. That the life which he came to bring, yes, in the future it will be a, of a kind of a, a, a greater quality because we'll be perfect. But it begins now. It starts now. Because we've crossed over from death to life in this life when we come to believe and trust in Jesus. So that's what that's what Jesus says. And John is very clear that that eternal life is not something which is only for the future, but begins in this life now. Um, so let me just read you a quote from um, C.S. Lewis. Um, it's funny how how much um, things kind of revolve around C.S. Lewis. As I was preparing for this um, this morning, um, this quote from C.S. Lewis just kind of sprang to mind. Now, this is from Mere Christianity, and this is where he, he kind of is talking about the difference between um, biological life and spiritual life. So uh, let me read you what he says. In reality, the difference between biological life and spiritual life is so important that I am going to give them two distinct names. The biological sort which come to us through nature and which, like everything else in nature, is always tending to run down and decay so that it can only be kept up by incessant subsidies from nature in the form of air, water, food, etc., is bios. The spiritual life which is in God from all eternity and which made the whole natural universe is zoe. Bios has to be sure a certain shadowy or symbolic resemblance to Zoe, but only the sort of resemblance there, uh, uh, only the sort of resemblance there is between a photo and a place, or a statue and a man. A man who changed from having Bios to having Zoe would have gone through as big a change as a statue which changed from being a carved stone to being a real man. And that is precisely what Christianity is about. 
This world is a great sculptor's shop. We are the statues. And there is a rumour going round the shop that some of us are someday going to come to life. Think about that. I love that image. You know, that um, we are the statues and there's a rumour going round that some of us are one day going to come to life. And that's the difference between what he calls bios, just kind of the base biological life, and zoe, or which kind of is where our, our name Zoe comes from. My daughter's called Zoe. Um, there we go. We named, we named her actually, knowing it was it was life. Um, funny enough, I didn't think of that at the time. Actually, how how significant that would be. Anyway, um, but yeah, this is the thing that uh, the life that God gives is that what C.S. Lewis calls the the Zoe Zoe kind of life. You know, true spiritual life, and it's it's the difference between that and base biological life is the difference between a photo and a place or a statue and a man you know that they may look kind of similar but one is 2d and the other one is is real living breathing 3d and and everything and that's the difference between biological life and spiritual life and it's possible to have the one without the other and this is why I think Jesus says, I come that they may have life. And he actually uses that word zoe there. I come that they may have life and have it to the full. You know, this, this kind of full spiritual life, uh, eternal life, yes. But a life which is, you know, full life, is rich, is, you know, is everything that life is meant to be. Not just survival, but is, is full and rich and you know what what human what humanity what human beings should be doing with our lives you know we should be living so i thought what cs lewis there uh, said there was really uh, really insightful um yeah we we want more than biological life we want spiritual life so what should the church be what's the church's role in all of this um so let me read you just a couple of verses from ephesians chapter 3 this is verse uh, 10 and 11 his intent, that God's intent, uh, was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now this is just one verse uh, that I've chosen, there are many others that I could have chosen. But I like this because the church should show the world and it, Paul uses actually says the the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms to all you know to the the spiritual forces um in the heavenly realms as well to everyone um it should demonstrate the wisdom of God and the the power of God so the church should be a demonstration of everything that's good about the gospel everything that's good about life now the church by living the kind of life that we should be living are demonstrating something about god and his wisdom and power and glory and splendor to to the world so that's what we should be be there for the church should be there to show the world what life should be like you know the church is the little outpost of of what life will be like in the new creation and we're starting to live that life now. And, you know, when people look at the church, they should be able to see how good it is for people to live with God. That is what the church is there for. So that leads us neatly onto the question of what li uh, what should life be like? You know, what, what should life be like? And that's what we're going to do over these coming weeks. But I thought it was important to start with that, just to say that, you know, Christians, those who believe and trust in the Lord Jesus, should be living true life. Should be living true life. And I don't think we have been. I don't think we were prior to 2020, actually. Um, and I'll maybe uh, come back to that uh, a bit later. Uh, so the first thing to say then is that um, in terms of relationships, which is what we're looking at today, that man was made for relationship. So this is what it says in Genesis 1 verse 26. Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. A famous verse right at the beginning of the Bible. Now have you ever thought, really thought about that verse? Thought, what does that mean? You know, let us 
make mankind in our image, in our likeness. Think, who is the us? Who is the, the we there? And the answer that the church has come up with for 2,000 years, very nearly 2,000 years, is the Trinity. That, you know, God is not simply a, a one, but is a um, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. There is only one God. But there were three persons, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now, this is what my um, former, uh, the, the principal of my theological college, uh, Mike Hovey, said. Uh, and I'll quote him an article from him in just a moment. He says this, that the Trinity is from eternity, a perfect community of other person centred love. So we as human beings are made in God's image and we are made to resemble God and we are made therefore to be that perfect community of love in the way that God is so as God is father son and holy spirit uh, uh, that community of love so we on earth and especially in in the church should be that community of love of other person centered love that's what we need to be because as God is that's how he made us and this is fundamental to how we understand ourselves um, so I'll quote you some of a, an essay by Mike Ovey this is an essay called um, the human identity crisis can we do without the trinity published on in the, by the jubilee center the Cambridge papers and um, I'll put a link to this essay down below as well, because I think you know, if you're interested in this, how the Trinity kind of leads to understand our understanding of our identity, then um, this is really a really good essay to, um, to read. But let me quote you just a little bit of what he said. In terms of God himself, Father, Son and, and Spirit, the Trinity means that we do not have a monist or individualist God. For God... Personal identity is found in relationships rather than in the kind of self-contained, undifferentiated unity that tends to underlie Boethius, Descartes and Kant. We locate the Father by reference to his relationships with the Son and the Spirit. He himself, as Father, is, in a way, defined by where he stands with respect to the other persons of the Trinity. In that way, Personal relationships are essential and not optional extras. And this implies for humans made in his image that we know ourselves truly in relationship, not in isolation. We know ourselves truly in relationship, not in isolation. And relationships are essential, not optional extras. That's what he said. And that's what the doctrine of the Trinity does for our view of humanity that relationships are, they're fundamental. They are absolutely fundamental to who we are as people. They are not dispensable, but that they are integral to our identity. In fact, we only find our identity as people in relationship to, to other human beings. You know, think about a, a child, a baby who's born. A baby, when it's first born, the, the only thing that you know for sure about it is that it has a mother and father somewhere. And and that's true of every single baby that's born. It's born into a relationship. And then, it, you know, it develops relationships with the community, with a wider family, with the community and so on. So that's the thing. You know, we are born into relationships. They're not optional extras. So that's really important to understand. Just as an aside... Um, We've just, um, I, I quoted here from Mike Ovey. Mike was the principal of the theological college I trained at. That's um, Oak Hill in, uh, in North London. And um, he, uh, he sadly died five years ago. Um, we've just had the five-year anniversary of his, uh, his death. He died of a heart attack in his late 50s, very tragically. And, um, you know, I just wanted to publicly say just how much I miss him. And if you appreciate what I do... Uh, here on sacred musings or you know anything that I do uh, in the Christian sense then you know you have a lot to thank this man for because he was you know really like to so many of his students he was like a mentor he was so much more than just a you know a, a tutor but he really lived what he 
he taught, um, he practiced what he preached. And, you know, he's a real example to, to all of us. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to say that just to, as a little tribute to him, uh, Mike Ovi. OK, so the next uh, the next thing then is to think about relationships in the church. So if relationships are fundamental to human identity, then what does that say about relationships in the church? What does the New Testament say about that? How does it, it kind of pick up that theme? Well, um, sometimes people ask the question, can you be a Christian without going to church? And it's actually there isn't a, a verse in the New Testament which says you have to go to church to be a Christian. And that is actually because it's just the, the, New, the New Testament and the whole Bible just assumes if you're part of the people of God, you're there corporately. You know, there is no such thing as an isolated Christian who is not part of the church. That's that's uh, um, anathema. You know that to be a Christian means to be part of the church. That's just what it means. Now, sadly, I know that um, many people, I know some some of you who who watch this or who, who listen, um, have had to leave churches or had a very difficult experience. And I know that there are all sorts of problems at the moment. But if you think about the church as just the the body of of believers around the world and throughout history, then we all belong to that. Whether um, you know whether we we um, there are problems in the local fellowship or not, we all belong to the universal church, to the as the creed calls it, the Catholic Church, the universal church. Um, now, how does the, the the Bible describe the church? Well, it's described in many ways, but quite often it's described as a family. So this is what Jesus said. Um, this is his, um, he was teaching and his mother and his brothers came in and said, uh, and um, they said, oh, you know, he's got to come out, you know, he's, he's gone, gone off his rails. Um, and uh, someone comes to Jesus and said, your mother and your brothers are looking for you. And Jesus replies, who are my mother and my brothers? He asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle round him and said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. So Jesus says that those who do God's will are his family. And there are more real family to him than his biological uh, brother, brothers and sisters and um, his mother. There are more real family. They have more of a, you know, a relationship with him. And that was very clear in what he said. And that's backed up. Again, he, he says in uh, Matthew 10, verse 37, anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So, you know that expression that uh, blood is thicker than water? You know, that the idea that our family bonds are thicker than our friendships. Or, I'm not sure if that's exactly right, but you know that our blood bonds are closest. Actually, I think what Jesus would say is that our bond with him, the spiritual bond with Jesus, is closer and deeper than anything else. And even our blood relationships, um, you know, Jesus should come first. And the church, therefore, as his people, should come first. And I know that there are many people who've sadly um, decided to follow Jesus and have, have been ostracised from their family. It's not so common in this country. I mean, if you think about it in, a, in an Islamic country, someone who decides to follow Jesus faces death or, you know, never seeing their family again sometimes. And that's really, really tough for them. Um, but, you know, in this country, people do get ostracised. You know, people do have strained relationships with their parents or something. You know, their parents wanted them to follow a certain career path and then they become a Christian at university. That kind of thing happens. They decide to become a Christian worker instead of a a lawyer or a doctor or something it can really strain relationships so jesus has to come first and his people have to come first um, i think sometimes people say that the church is like a family i would put it the other way around actually i think that a family the biological family is like the church you know, i think god gave us the family to actually show us what the church should be like and how close we should be you know the church comes first and what should the church be like? How should we be with each other? There's one more quote here from Jesus. 
Uh, he says this, By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Love is what we should be known for as a community, as a church, loving one another. That's the, the one thing that God really wants us to do. And actually, um, in um, in a, this, this last week, I've just started a new series on my other channel which is understand the bible which is doing you know kind of general teaching about about the bible and about christianity looking at the ten commandments and uh, i quoted from um, romans 13 verse 10 which says this love does no harm to a neighbor therefore love is the fulfillment of the law love is literally everything that god wants us to do and the Ten Commandments were given to help us understand what that love actually looked like, particularly to a people who who didn't understand at that point. But we, uh, you know, we need to love one another. That's what God wants us to do. And the church should be known for for the love between us. The church should be known for looking out for one another, for loving one another, for you know. In the, the early days of the church, that people used to um, consider uh, that the church was immoral because of how much they loved one another and spent spent time together. And that's the, kind of the level of um, you know, love that there should be. You know, we should be, uh, we should be loving one another so that the, the world sits up and takes notice. If you'd like um, a bit more on this, then um, you can look at my video that I did. It's only in video format, I'm afraid, not on the podcast. Um, the introduction to the Ten Commandments, where I look into this in a little bit more detail. So you might like to have a little look at that um, in a, uh, after this. So let's just summarise before we think briefly about how this has worked out with COVID. Uh, the church should be displaying to the world the kind of life which only God can give. That's life to the full. The church should be a demonstration that of the kind of life that God offers, which is not you know a mediocre life or a half life, but full, rich life. And relationships are a deeply fundamental part of human life. They are as essential to us as breathing and eating. And I think we can see, start to see there how over the last couple of years, how, you know, we've we've been allowed to go and do essential things such as shopping. So, you know, yes, your eating is, is essential to your biological life, but actually you haven't been allowed to see your friends and your family at points, which is um, as essential to us as eating. You know, a human existence is based on relationship and you know, you can't take that away without denying something about our humanity. And the church should be a closer family than your biological family. You know, the church should be a, an actual family, not a, um, you know, oh, we call ourselves a family, but we're not really. We, our real family is our biological family. Um, this came home to me, actually, um, over Christmas. Um, one of our, our young people is not from a, a Christian home in fact her, her parents don't um don't live together and um she said to me that her christmas um christmas day for her you know her said she said her mum goes off to work her dad goes to the pub and she said isn't it a shame on christmas day that people go to their families and you know she's kind of at home on her own and uh, you know i just yeah it, it it was it just struck me that you know that for her the church is a family in a way that uh, her biological family isn't. And, you know, I, I think this is why, actually, we might come on to this more in another in another episode, but I think at the moment, the world is so broken uh, that I think the church needs to do a better job of being a family than it, it has done before. Um, so that's just a, a quick reflection there. But let's think about, um, finally, just briefly, about uh, why I think, therefore, all of the COVID restrictions which we've been under have been toxic to relationships. Now, the main thing is that they they presuppose this idea that we should conceive of relationships primarily in terms of safety. So, you know, it's it's thinking that, well, relationships, yes, they're important, but we need to have this 
this banner of safety over everything because we want that to be the ruling um you know idea safety we want to keep everyone safe even if that means impinging on relationships and and i think that's been that's not just wrong but i think it's actually destroyed uh, relationships you know and this is this is the thing it's not just a mask it's not just uh, social distancing but it's actually the damage that these things are doing to our mindset it's the idea that we because we're having to think about safety you know we are thinking about ourselves primarily in terms of not being a danger to others or we are thinking about others about primarily about being a danger to us that's that's what wearing a mask does and that's what social distancing does it's not those things in themselves you know those things in themselves i mean i i don't agree with them because i don't think they work i think far more dangerous is the the mindset that they cultivate which is that we we conceive of other people as a danger and we don't we start to think not in terms of you know how can i love these people actively love them but how can i actually um avoid them how can i not give them something you know and yes you, you might think about love but it's a very distant kind of love you know whereas what if someone needs a, a hug you know what if someone needs physical touch which we all do it's you know we we really do need physical touch um then you know what if that's more important and what if that relationship is more important than the the very tiny risk that you might have something and pass that on to them you know throughout history we've always thought of relationships as being worth um you know the risk and you know it's only in the last couple of years that that's that's flipped around and i think this is it's been so toxic to to our understanding and and our human identity as relational uh, people just one little um something ham yeah someone told me yesterday just to give you a little picture of this in anglican churches um in communion uh, communion services um often we share the peace now the peace for those of you who are not anglicans um is a bit controversial because it wasn't in the original book of common prayer but it's been introduced later and it's the point of the service where people go round and say peace be with you and shake one another's hands and actually in our church we we kind of stopped shaking hands we just kind of wait you know look round and wave at each other uh, at, at, for the peace at the moment um i have to say though i'm not a fan of the peace i remember when i first went into a, an anglican church and they did the peace it was like whoa this is a bit strange you know um what's going on here so um yeah i i think it's um uh you know it's a bit weird for out for people who are not used to it um so i like what it's trying to say anyway um a friend of mine went to a, a service yesterday um and there was community service they they shook hands you know at the peace which they thought was nice oh yeah it's lovely to shake hands but then after that everyone got out their hand sanitizers and sanitized their their hands and they said you know what what does that saying that you know we're all just dirty filthy people and we just have to sanitize our hands i don't sanitize my hands after touching my daughters or anything like that you know it's it's it would have been considered rude prior to to 2020 to do that you know what are you saying about people and this is the exact thing you know it's it's treating people as primarily as bearers of infection rather than as being people to love and people to treat treat well and and this is the whole problem with the the covid uh, restrictions it's toxic to genuine loving relationships just to finish off this section um there was just one thing i, I was going to say this at the beginning actually but i forgot um but it's it's just this that i think a lot of people in society are thinking what we need to do is get back to normal you know we need to get back to how things were back in uh, in 2020 or before 2020 you know we need to get back to the old normal well i think there's a lot of merit to that but actually i think what the last couple of years have revealed is that the old normal wasn't that great in the first place and i think that what we need to do as the church is to say how should we be living you know and that's what i'm trying to do here is rather than going back to what how we were doing things before i think how could we be doing things even better and this is why i think um you know we need to be focusing on this like i said 
for a lot of people, they don't have traditional families anymore. And a lot of younger people, I think are, and older people too, are crying out for family and for community. They're desperate for it, especially after what we've been through the last two years. And sadly, I think what the church offered prior to 2020 was not the kind of family, the kind of relationship that we really needed. And so this is this is what I'm trying to say here, that, you know, we need to, to look forward rather than looking backwards to the old normal. We need to look forward to the way that life should be. And we need to be seeking to build a um, to build back better. I say build back better. If I can say use that phrase and perhaps t- you know take it in a in a more appropriate sense, you know we need to let God shape us to to actually um, you know reshape the way that we should be as a church to to have the kind of life which we we should have because that's what the world really needs at the moment. You know the world has been starved of genuine love and genuine relationships for a long time, and people are desperate and thirsty for this kind of thing if we can offer that to them in a genuine and godly way i think that will be far you know that will be far more important than just simply you know preaching the gospel with our lips and this is what you know, goes back to what i was saying last week we need to live in line with the truth of the gospel not just proclaim the gospel with our mouths you know we need to to, to actually have a gospel community and that is what the world desperately needs right now i believe so um that's something to um that's something to pray about and and and, and look for so just as we come to the end um as uh, as usual we're going to have a little reflection from the bible and this is actually a verse that someone sent me uh, over this last week um so thank you for, for sending this verse in or these verses in um and uh, i thought i'd include this as the biblical reflection um i mean this is the thing. There are so many verses from the Bible that you could talk about, um, you know, just as being relevant to what we're going through. But I, I really like this one. So this is 2 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, verses 12 to 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 to 18. Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses, who will put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed, because only in Christ it is taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Now, I've, this passage is kind of, I've thought about this passage a few times over the, the past um, year or two, just particularly with respect to masks, you know, about the, the veil over, over faces and how the government and you know churches have been asking us to wear to wear masks and you know i do think there is a symbolism in that because our you know um, an unveiled face is a you know when you put something over your face you are you know cutting yourself off from other people and i just think this is fascinating that you know like i, I kind of said last week that i think the mask is more than just a, a bit of cloth but it is actually you know, there's a deeper spiritual significance to wearing one, which again is not to say that I think everyone who wears one is is doing the wrong thing, because um, there are lots of different reasons. Um, but certainly, I think you know when you're if you're wearing one and you know it's a lie, um, but you're you know you're going along with it, especially in the context of a church, then I think it's it's this idea of the veil, isn't it? You know, letting something else, some other truth, take precedence over what we know. God has given the truth uh, to be. And, you know, it talks about the veil over and not seeing, not seeing like when the Bible is read, uh, only being taken away in Christ. And, um, you know, I think this is something which is, you know, really significant for the church that, you know, when we come to Christ, we come to the truth. You know, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life. Not just the truth about the Bible, uh, but the truth about everything, the truth about the way that we should live. 
And so we need to to let him set the the agenda for the way that we are as a church, for the way that we should live you know, and to live not by by lies, uh, but to live by the truth. And I love that that verse there. You know, the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is. There is freedom. I thought that's such a contrast to the lockdown, isn't it? You know, the the lockdown says, you no, know, you have to obey the rules. You have to keep all these rules to keep everyone safe. But the uh, God says where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom because we when we love others, we can trust everything to him and we can just seek to to love him and love others in the way that he guides us to, which sometimes might mean refraining, uh, but most times perhaps will mean, you know, actively doing something to, to love others, um, you know, just being friends, um, showing love. And um, and that's the good news. You know, when we have the Holy Spirit, that is true freedom. And that's what we've all been seeking, isn't it? You know, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And it's actually as we contemplate with unveiled faces the Lord's glory, we, we're being transformed. You know, when we live by the truth, when we live by the truth of the gospel and the, the truth, just everything, you know, then then we actually see the Lord and, you know, we, we, we are transformed into his image. And I think this is such a lovely passage to to reflect on, you know, thinking about how, you know, God does take us and transform us um, through his truth. And, you know, that actually when we when we are living by the truth, there is and living by the spirit, there is freedom. And that's really a lovely thing to just spend a bit of time reflecting on and, and thinking about. And that's a good, good place to end, um, I think. So let's uh, let's pray as we come to a close and ask God for his help in living in this kind of way and uh, just praying that the church across across the land across the world would live up to the kind of church which God wants us to be so heavenly father we uh, thank you that you do give life you give true life and you give freedom um, we thank you lord that where your spirit is there is freedom and we pray that as a church, you would help us to have the kind of life which you want us uh, to have, the kind of uh, the kind of church that you want us to have that demonstrates that love, that relationship, that community, which the world desperately needs and craves right now. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to play our part in that, whatever that may be, um, and just to have wisdom day by day as we seek to live by the truth, uh, the truth of your word and the truth that is there in the world. Um, we just pray, Lord, that you would help us to look to you in everything. And we pray for your blessing uh, upon us this week in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks so much, everyone, for joining me today uh, for this podcast. I've forgotten what, what um, episode number this is, actually. Um, but um, anyway, um, thank you for joining me. Don't forget, there is a, um, a buy me a coffee link if you'd like to express your appreciation in that way. Thanks so much to everyone who has contributed. Uh, I really do uh, appreciate that. And also, um, if you're on YouTube, don't forget to do the liking as well. Give me a thumbs up as that does help. And if you'd like to leave me a comment, you can do that underneath the video or you can send them in via my website. And I'm going to try and set up a um, Sacred Musings email address as well. So you can just email in by, by that. That might be a bit easier. Anyway, thanks so much and um, I look forward to joining you next week and we'll be looking at fear uh, next week or not fearing. So uh, yeah, have a good week. God bless and I'll see you again soon.